for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heavens of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Well, be a monarch for a while. Um, I'm Dr. Melissa Aaron. I'm from the Department of English and Foreign Languages at Cal Poly Pomona, and here we are on the set of Romeo and Juliet. Um, the theater department is doing that this year, and um, this beautiful set was designed by Bill Morse, and it's a really interesting opportunity for us to look at both of the qualities that he's used from the Elizabethan theater, which are many of which are quite accurate, put into this proscenium arch stage. It's a really interesting opportunity to see the differences in the way they work together. Okay, um, there are some things that you just can't do. Um, we can't just rip off the roof, right? Um, we can't just yank out all of the seating um, where you have been sitting in relative comfort and make you suffer by standing the whole time. Um, and even at the Globe Theater in London, um, we really can't do that either. Um, there's no way of being perfectly authentic at the Globe Theater in London where it's open to the sky. Um, they're on the flight path to Heathrow, so you hear planes going back and forth. Um, however, this has used some very interesting elements. Um, up here, you can see that there is a ceiling. Um, there's a little hut effect, like a roof. And on the globe stage, what this would have been is an actual little overhanging roof that would have protected the actors if there was some kind of inclement weather. Their costumes were very expensive. They didn't want them getting wet. The audience could see the underside of that and that would have been painted with the sun and the moon and the stars and a little zodiac up there. Obviously, they need the lights up here, so what this is is a little mock-up of that. Um, they've also got the pillars on either side. Those are, in the globe, an architectural feature. They need to use it to hold up the ceiling and to hold up the, the roof. Um, you'll notice that these have been cheated out a bit. Um, these would, if this were the Globe Theater, probably be a little further down, and they would have been further in. This is not something that those of us who are used to a proscenium arch are used to at all. Um, on the pillar itself, it's been painted to look like marble. And we know that this is an accurate thing. Um, we have some records, some eyewitness accounts, which are very rare, of um, somebody going to see the Swan Theater. And they know that at the Swan Theater, they had these things painted with gold and also painted with artificial marble. Um, we tend to like this sort of half timbering effect, the Tudor effect that you have up there. Um, that's because that would have been the standard thing. To us, it looks really old fashioned and exotic and cool. The Elizabethans liked loud, disgusting, tacky coloring. <laughs> so we've, start, we've left in a little bit of that with the marbling and a little bit of the gold little Corinthian columns up there. Um, in some ways, the closest parallel to this is not at the Globe, but at the Blackfriars, which is an indoor theater and has a little bit more intimacy. Um, the stage, obviously, this is another thing that really can't be quite replicated, but Bill's done a really nice job of getting the effect. Um, at the Globe Theater, this would have projected into the yard, and audience would have been on the sides, they would have been able to lean up on the stage and look at it, and they really would have been all the way around and into that. That's not something that's available to it, so um, what we have here instead is a rate stage. It's sort of a thrust stage. You have the effect of it projecting out without really having to do some major structural overhauls. Um, the most important thing is the entrances. Now, in Elizabethan theater, the entrances are always from the back. This is, goes back to the Romans and the Greeks. All the entrances are in the back, in that section that the Elizabethans called the Tiring House, and that the Romans called the Frans Scanae, and that the Greeks called the Scanae. So it goes back a long, long way. 
Um, all of the entrances are stable, and that means that you can have this be a house, you can have it be a street, you can have it be just about anything you want. Um, so you have these, these entrances back and forth. Um, and all of those things come from that. You'll also notice that what we have up here is an alcove of some sort. Sometimes people call that an alcove. Sometimes people used to call this the inner stage because people had an idea that there were whole scenes acted up there. But now we're pretty sure they didn't. Um, and one of the most useful things that you can do with that alcove is you can push things out from it, large props like um, the throne that we have over there. Um, that would have been in an Elizabethan theater, a largish prop that they could have brought out and demonstrated some things with. Or this, which is something that doubles both as a bed and as Juliet's beer in the last act, that's something that people could carry out and place and it would stay there for a long time. The Elizabethans didn't use scenery in our sense of the word. There was nothing there that was sitting there just looking pretty. Anything that they bothered to put out here would have been functional. So that's functional. The, the throne, throne that I showed you before, that's functional. Um, another thing that is true here, and this sounds very obvious, is that obviously we can't use natural light. Um, that is the main thing that would have been the case at the Globe or even at the Blackfriars. Um, at the Blackfriars, they had casement windows so they could let in some kind of sunlight. And they also used torches, they used candles. Um, that was the way that they did things. The main difference would have been that the difference in the lighting between where I am standing and where you are theoretically and virtually sitting is that we would have been at the same lighting level. I could see you as well as you can see me. And that's something that isn't typical of the modern theater. We're used to having the lights out in the house. Um, and it's just really not something that we can quite do. Um, what we have here is we have a nice light cue that doesn't change very much. So you have the, almost the effect of universal lighting. Now, this is also, though, a proscenium arch. And a proscenium arch is something that came in in the 17th century and the 18th century. It literally is a picture frame. If this was an old-fashioned proscenium arch, what you would have would be literally some kind of a picture frame going around the outside. In old-fashioned theaters of the 17th and 18th century, the actors did not go back into there at all. Instead of the nice deep stage that you have during the Renaissance, you have a very shallow stage because everything up there is for the picture. It's for a, um, a perspective, a deep effect of showing um, a Roman street or showing a country vista. And part of the special effect is the, is the spectacular scenery that keeps changing. They had that during Shakespeare's time, but public theaters did not use them. So when it started to be used for public theaters, the actors would have moved just in this little tiny narrow area called the apron. That would have been lit with a lot of candles. Um, actors would actually find the nice lighting sweet spot. And if they were mean, they was called the rose. If they were mean, they'd kind of edge each other out of the nice sweet spot, the nice light. So um, that was all lit there, and then everything else was just meant to be pretty up there. This current production of Romeo and Juliet uses both the entrances from the back and the entrances on the sides. So it's using both of the effects from um, the proscenium arch stage and from the, um, from the uh, Elizabethan stage. What I would like to do is I'd like to bring in one of my students, Amanda Lee, who's kindly offered to help me um, demonstrate where this would go. Um, Amanda, if you would be so good. Hi, Amanda. Say hello to the nice people. Um, Amanda, if you would go up there into one of the offstage um, uh, entrances, and if you would come and, and walk straight across and go back up there, back into that entrance. And I'll just stand out of the way here. Okay. 
Okay, and you can actually go much further down than that, believe it or not. See, one of the things that's nice about this is that you have the effect of being able to be quite deep. And Amanda, if you would stand over there by the pillar. Now, you can stand there, and you can pretend that you're Benvolio, all right? And you can just look where the poor wretch comes, sadly. I'm temporarily Romeo, sadly, okay? Okay, just look where the poor wretch comes, sadly. Now, the thing about this is, if Amanda's there, and I'm coming in from up there, it's perfectly credible for Amanda to say to the audience out there, look how sad he looks, and have me not hear it, because I'm way up there. Now, let's try this. Amanda, if you'll come in that way, and I'll come in this way, right, very shallow on the, in that front wing. You can come on in. Out to the audience. Look where the poor wretch comes sadly. It looks like I can hear, I should, you know, what do you mean? I just heard you. I'm not looking sad, <laughs> right? So one of the effects of having this nice deep thing is that you can have very long cues in which an actor who is far downstage can see an actor who is far upstage say all kinds of things to the audience and have us react in some way. Um, so this particular um, production uses things from the bat on each side. We are used to a proscenium arch style. We are used to flat movie screens and flat television screens and flat computer screens. So we're used to this sort of back and forth flat pattern. Um, it takes a lot of effort for us to think of everything going towards the back. Um, and it's really important to, to think of that. And that's why it's really helpful to have this all here. You'll also notice that they have this aloft space. That space in the globe or in the swan or in the rose would have had, in addition to a little balcony, it would have probably had musicians up there all the way across. And actually, those were also the most expensive seats in the house. That was, those were the Lord's rooms. We almost never do that in modern productions, not even in replica theaters like the Globe and the Blackfriars, and here's why. Audience members who are paying as much money as that want to be able to see the production. They want to be able to see everything, and so they don't want to sit up there. And the other thing is we're used to not seeing people be somewhere close into the action. We don't like it. So generally speaking, that's something that they wouldn't have, but it's something, it's something they would have had, I'm sorry, but we usually don't. It's just not a helpful thing for most productions. Okay, what I'd like to do is now that we've shown you some of the marvelous things on the stage, um, I'd like to take a brief pause, and um, Amanda and I will show you how some of this works in Richard III and then in Hamlet. Okay, here we are back on the set of Romeo and Juliet, and I'd like to demonstrate some things about the way this stage could be used for Richard III. Now, we're usually used to this being the balcony scene, and for the aloft space to be this romantic scene with um, Romeo down here and Juliet up there, and it is the east and Juliet is the sun and all that. But Shakespeare doesn't just use this for Romeo and Juliet, he also uses it in Richard III, where it becomes kind of a gross parody of, um, of the balcony scene. Just to set the stage, um, Buckingham and Richard are in cahoots to get Richard to the English throne. Buckingham has set up this scene where Richard is going to be backstage pretending that he's praying and not interested in being king. And Buckingham is going to down, stand down here and beg Richard to please be king. So if you'll just sort of hang out up there. Um, that's Amanda, once again, Amanda Lee, my lovely assistant. I'm Buckingham, hi. <laughs> 
And Buckingham comes in surrounded by the mayor and some aldermen. No, it is your fault that you are not king. Zooms, I'll entreat no more. And Buckingham has this false exit. Um, and so you have all of these people standing underneath Richard, begging him to please be king. And you can see how this looks very much like the Romeo and Juliet balcony scene. And my theory for this has always been that that was somewhat intentional, that you have this effect of um, back and forth, use of the loft, and down here, that you can create that kind of effect. Another example of how this aloft space might have been used is in Henry V. In Henry V, there is a speech that you're probably familiar with, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, where Henry actually says to attack um, Parflu. And what this becomes in that case, instead of Juliet's balcony or Richard's palace, this becomes the siege walls of Harflu. And the um, army comes in with scaling ladders, and they actually put the ladders up here and start to assault the area. So he says, let's go back there, let's attack. You know, once more into the breach, dear friends, God for Harry England and St. George. He's actually saying, hey, come on, let's go up there and attack the governor of Harflu. You're the governor of Harflu now, Amanda. Are you good with that? Okay, so those are two of Shakespeare's history plays, and that's a use of the aloft space. And in a minute, I'd like to show you some of the ways that this stage works with Hamlet and the discovery space. Okay, welcome back to the set of Romeo and Juliet. And what we're going to d demonstrate right now for you is the use of a couple of other elements of this stage and the way it might apply in Hamlet. In Hamlet, there's a number of very tricky um, staging things that have to be done, some of which we just can't replicate. Um, in the last act, there's a very substantial use of the grave trap, which we don't have. Um, in Act 5, you have um, Ophelia's body lowered into it. You have skulls being thrown up out of it. You have Hamlet jumping into it and Laertes jumping into it, and then they have a fist fight in it. But alas, we have no grave trap. Um, but what we do have are some other problems we can solve. One of them is the play within a play scene in um, where Hamlet sets a mouse trap and has Gertrude and Claudius watch this play that is supposed to be like the murder of his father. Um, the only problem is, where do you have the play, where do you have Gertrude and Claudius, and where do you have Hamlet? Now, there's a lot of different theories about that. If you have Gertrude and Claudius down here with their backs to you, then it's nice you can have the actors right up there, right? Amanda, would you, um, this is my lovely assistant, Amanda Lee, if she would, um, you'd just stand right there. Amanda gets to be all three actors at once. If they're like this and they're looking up there, then that's nice because the audience can see but then you can't really hear Gertrude and Claudius, and they do have some lines. Another alternative possibility would be um, for the actors to be down there and for Gertrude and Claudius to be up here. Now, this is good for a number of reasons. For one thing, it enables them to take the throne or the state from the um, discovery space back there. That is where they kept most of the big props and that's where they came out. So that would have the benefit of having Gertrude and Claudius be able to stand, sit here and watch, this is so unkingly, um, but uh, to be able to watch while the actors do their little thing down there. And of course you can pour some poison in the porches of some people's ears. And also you get the advantage of having Claudius be able to watch that and panic or not panic, as the case may be. Now the question would also be, where's Hamlet during all this? And there's a variety of different ways that you could do that, but one of the things that they might well have done is used one of these stage pillars. Hamlet always seems to me to be hanging around near the stage pillars. This is where he can comment on things, 
he can look at that, he can look at that, and he can make his little snotty aside remarks that he always does seem to be. Um, also, this way, he can look at his mother, which he seems to be very concerned almost more about the reactions of his mother than the reactions of his, um, his uncle um, with the murder situation. So that's the way the play within a play might have been staged. But since, of course, we can't set the Wayback Machine and go, we'll never really know. This is why having a stage like this to play with is really very helpful. We can workshop different solutions and see how things might have been done. Let's move this over to one side. If this were an Elizabethan theater, this probably would have happened in full view of the audience. They did not worry about the fact that the lights were up, there were no lights to go down, it just happened. And luckily, this isn't very heavy. Now, another thing that happens in Hamlet that has to be solved is the death of Polonius. And Polonius, as you may know, loves to hide behind heiresses. He loves to hide behind curtains. In a scene right before the play within a play, Hamlet and Ophelia are supposed to meet, and Polonius goes up there with the king to hide and see it. And Amanda, if you would. Right. Now, in the globe, we think what they may have had was not just these doors, but also a curtain, so it would be soft, and there would be an easy way for them to seem to be hiding behind the arras, hiding behind the curtain, and that way Polonius comes on out after the thing doesn't go as well, and there he is. Now, later in the play, you may remember that he says that he wants to hide behind the arras in Gertrude's bedroom and overhear what Hamlet is saying to Gertrude. And if this is already a part of the stage, if this is a permanent feature, that means that Polonius can simply go back to where he was, and there he is. So Amanda, if you would just go right back there. Okay. So Polonius is in exactly the same place he was before, which draws a nice visual parallel, and also gives this idea of maybe you can hide behind one too many heiresses. Let's say I'm Hamlet, and I hear Polonius yelling, help, help, oh, help. And Hamlet has to go and stab him. And then Polonius has to be dead. If you've ever had to be dead on stage for an extended period of time, you know it's really hard. Everyone wants to look at you. Everyone is thinking, did he breathe? Did he breathe? I thought I saw him breathe. So it's really awkward. And I suspect that Shakespeare may have used the way the globe already was to make this much easier. Hamlet can run up here and say, dead for a ducat, dead! And he can even have his whole arm in there and a pointy sword. And you know what? There's Amanda. He's perfectly fine. There she is. And then, of course, you can just, oh, I am slain. <laughs> Want to yell, oh, I am slain? Oh, I am slain! She is slain. And then we can go like this, and you can just be slain over there, right? She's slain, and then once we're done with this, we just close this up or we pull the curtains, and Amanda slash Polonius is free to go off and grab herself a beer or whatever she'd like to do with the rest of Hamlet, which is a fairly long play. So she's done a little bit early. And we're actually done now, too. Um, I want to thank very much the theater department and Linda Bassesti, whose production of Romeo and Juliet this is, and Bill Morse, who built this lovely set and also Media Vision, Terry Hogan, who um, is doing the um, filming out there, and Amanda Lee, who is in my Shakespeare, my English um, 403 class. Um, thank you for watching. We deeply appreciate it. And um, all I can say is judge us kindly, which is how almost all Shakespearean plays end, with a shameless begging for applause.